For those who weren't here last Sunday evening, we're seeking to look at 1,500 years of church history in just two sermons. And that means we travel quickly and we cover an immense amount of ground. I don't expect you to remember it all, but nevertheless, I think it's helpful to see the unfolding purpose of God and to see how things came about that we know only too well. Now, last week, my subject was how the church captured the world over the first 400 years by winning a physical battle over suffering, by winning a mental battle with heresy, and by winning a spiritual battle over other religion. And one thing I meant to say last week that I forgot to say is very important, and it's this. The Christians won that battle because they outlived they outthought and they outdied everyone else. That's not my statement, it's the statement of a Baptist scholar called Tiard Lover. And he said that was the secret of their victory. They outlived, that won the spiritual battle. They outthought, that won the mental battle. And they outdied, that won the physical battle. And therefore, they out survived everything else. Now, my subject tonight is much more unhappy and much more serious. My subject tonight is how the world captured the church over the next thousand years. There is a picture, a painting from the Middle Ages that portrays the church as a lifeboat. And in a tossing sea, the Christians in the lifeboat are reaching out to pluck from the waves people who are drowning. Now, that's quite a good picture of the church. It is a lifeboat, and it's gone into the world responding to the cry, S.O.S., save ourselves. But may I begin by saying this, the lifeboat must be in the sea, but if the sea gets into the lifeboat, then there's real trouble. The church must be in the world if it's going to save people's souls, but when the world gets into the church, then it's finished and it sinks. And the story of the next thousand years is how the sea got into the lifeboat and how the world got into the church. I'm going to take it in three chapters, if you like. I want to speak of how the world got into the church in the early ages, from about the year 100 to 400 AD. So I'm going back into the period we covered last Sunday. Even with all that victory, the world was beginning to get into the church. Then the second chapter is from about the year 400 to the year 1000, and we call those the Dark Ages. And the third chapter, which we'll take after a hymn, is the story of what we call the Middle Ages, roughly from about the year 1000 to 1500, which brings us within just a year or two of Martin Luther. Now, how did the world get into the church in the first 400 years? When there were martyrs like that, when there were preachers like that, when the battle was being won, how did the world get in? Well, four things happened during those first four centuries that began to water down the church of Jesus Christ. The first, regional bishops. The second, magic sacraments the third, established religion, and the fourth, nominal membership. These were the four things that began to erode the church of Jesus Christ, the church of the apostles, the church of the New Testament. Take first this matter of regional bishops. In the New Testament, you saw from last Sunday evening that every church had a number of bishops to itself. That is the divine pattern in the New Testament. They are either called elders or bishops or presbyters. It doesn't matter. The, the names refer to the same office. <laughs> Spiritual leaders. And so bishops in the New Testament were the same thing as we call elders in our church. Every church had a number of bishops. Stage number two was when each church reduced their bishops to one. Stage number three was when you had one bishop to many churches and the leadership was being concentrated in fewer hands. 
Now, you can't find that in the New Testament. It didn't happen for the first hundred years of the Christian church, but it happened in the second century AD. And now there emerged men of considerable power and influence, not many bishops to one church, but many churches to one bishop. And this departure from the divine order in the New Testament was quite clearly one of the first things that began to spoil and to change the character of the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, I fear I may be treading on corns in saying that, but I believe it implicitly. And if you want to know how it did that, I'll tell you privately. It's a long story. The second thing that began to erode the Church is this, a magic view of the sacraments. Take baptism. Instead of being an outward sign and symbol of the spiritual washing away of sins that comes to a man when he believes in Jesus, it began to be believed that the actual water and the use of the right formula saved a person from their sin, whatever their age. And that in fact, if you sinned after your baptism, you undid it and you couldn't get it again, so you'd better not. Now, this is a magic and superstitious view. And so they decided, first of all, that they better not be baptized until they were on their deathbed. After all, if you get baptized before you're dying, there's a big risk of sinning afterwards and undoing the good work of washing away your sin. And quite literally, people began to put off baptism until the doctor said there's no hope. And then they rushed for the minister and said, baptize. But then others said, but look, we might have a baby that dies. We'd much rather have the baptism right at the beginning of life and get the baby's sins washed away. We don't want our baby in hell. Now, both of these views were superstitious and magical. And unfortunately, it was the view of infant baptism which prevailed. And so babies began to be baptized about 150 years after Jesus Christ, a practice which has persisted to this day not over the majority of churches in the world, but over coming up to half, probably. And that practice meant that many began to say, I'm Christian, who had simply been christened or christened. That eroded the church of Jesus Christ. Similarly, the Lord's Supper was treated magically. It was in the first 400 years that they began to think that the bread actually was the flesh of Christ and that the wine actually was the blood. And therefore, since his actual flesh and blood were being offered, it was in fact a sacrifice. And therefore, the minister handling the bread and the wine must in fact be a priest. And all this idea of the Lord's Supper as a sacrifice and the ministers as priests began at this time through a magical view of that sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The third thing was established religion. When the emperor went to church, you can imagine everybody else did. And when the emperor Constantine said, from now on, there is only one official religion, and that is Christianity, you can imagine that everybody climbed on the bandwagon, so they did. It became fashionable, it became respectable to go to the church of the established religion of the country. And I still believe, treading on further corns, that an established religion produces fashionable and respectable Christianity. It's bound to. And I cannot find it in the New Testament. And so, fourthly, nominal membership came into the Church of Jesus Christ. And a man writing at the end of the second century AD said this, about 50, he meant about 50 AD, about 50, he was of the church who had received baptism and the Holy Spirit and called Jesus Lord. But about 180, who acknowledged the rule of faith, that is the creed, the New Testament canon and the authority of the bishops. In other words, people were joining for other reasons than that they believed in Jesus and had received his Holy Spirit. It was now an institution. Now, of course, there were protests. And at every stage when the church went wrong, there were protests. And the two protests in the first 400 years were two movements called Montanism and monasticism. And both of them were protests against a church that was getting wealthy, worldly, and was getting filled up with people who had never even been converted. 
Now, Montanism arose in what we now call Turkey and Asia Minor. A man called Montanus noticed that in scores of church members there was no trace of the Holy Spirit. And so he sought afresh the Holy Spirit of God. And there was a revival in Asia Minor. Now, I think if you wanted to know who they were most like today, they were Pentecostals. And they rediscovered the Holy Spirit of God. And the gifts of the Spirit came back into the church through Montanism. And a life came back into the worship and a vigor and a reality came back through this Pentecostal protest against the deadness of the church and against the worldliness of its members. With a tremendous emphasis on the return of Christ, with an insistence that nobody be a member of the church unless they could profess and possess a real faith in Christ, with holiness and fasting, with a serious Christian life, this Pentecostal revival challenged the existing church. But the bishops opposed it very severely. And I think you can guess why. The tragedy is that, as so often, this first Pentecostal movement in history went wrong. It went wrong because these people would not have teaching. They wanted the heat without the light. And you've got to have both. Light without heat is very cold. Heat without light is too hot. And they wouldn't listen to teaching of the scriptures on how to exercise spiritual gifts. And particularly it was the women of this movement who went wrong. And they began to produce prophetesses and others who were unbalanced, who were frenzied and fanatical, and who would not be controlled and who would not be told from the scripture how to exercise the gifts. And the tragedy is that that first Pentecostal revival ended in fanaticism and fizzled out. And that protest came to nothing. I think that's a word that every Pentecostal revival needs to know. We can learn from history. It arose as a good thing, as a protest against the deadness of the churches, as the present Pentecostal movement arose 60 years ago for precisely the same reason within the Church of England. But all the time such revival needs to be balanced with teaching, with the balanced use of gifts, with the scriptural breaks on the thing, or it becomes frenzied and it becomes fanatical. And it was the women who spoiled the movement. Now the other protest that came was in a very different way. Some years later, there were certain Christians in the church who said this church is so worldly, so dead, that the only hope of rediscovering Christianity is to get out of the church as well as out of the world. Now some of them, the early ones, decided to do it on their own. They were hermits. It's the strangest tale. There was, for example, let me get one of his names, St. Anthony was the first. He decided that he'd never be a real Christian until he got into the middle of the desert. The trouble was that when he got there, a lot of other Christians thought they'd join him, and he didn't want that. And above all, he found that his temptations were just as worldly sitting in a cave in the desert as they had been in the church. There was the even more peculiar hermit called Simon Stylites. He built himself a pillar 60 feet high, a yard across at the top, and he went up there and lived there for some 60 years. He even stood on one leg for a year to try and, as a protest, tell the church Christianity is something hard and tough. And so there he was, up the pole in more senses than one, covered in ulcers and worms, in a most frightful state, and poor old Simon Stylites has gone down into history as a man who tried to recover the true asceticism of the Christian faith and the true vigor and self-discipline of it in a worldly church. More successful than the hermits were those who started communities of Christians and said we must go out as a community. And the man who started this movement was a man called Benedict. And on Monte Cassino, halfway between Rome and Naples, this man gathered around him a group of real Christians who realized the church was so worldly, so dead, that they couldn't do anything with it, and said, we will come together and live together as Christians. We will not be wealthy, we will be poor. We will not be lustful, we will be celibate. 
We will not be rebellious, we will be obedient. And they adopted the threefold vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And it was run on the lines of a Roman soldier's garrison. And this monastery was a protest against a worldly church. The tragedy is that this protest went wrong just as certainly as the other had gone wrong. For Christ did not mean us to live the Christian life away from everybody else. And later these monks who started with a good intention of rediscovering Christianity became so wrapped up in their own salvation, so introverted, that they were isolated from the world and the church. Furthermore, the monks, I'm afraid, produced the idea that there are two sorts of Christians and two standards of Christians and two levels. There are second-class Christians who get married and first-class Christians who don't. There are second-class Christians who live in the world and there are first-class Christians who live out of it. Now that's not the teaching of Jesus. Our Lord was not a monk. He didn't withdraw from society. He lived a pure life in the society. And he told his disciples to be in the world without being of it. So that this protest was not the right one, but it was a sincere protest. Now let me sum up then how the world got into the church in the first 400 years. They came in through regional bishops and the concentration of power and leadership in regional areas, copying incidentally the Roman Empire with its governors, came in through magical sacraments which began to, re to view baptism and the Lord's Supper wrongly, came in through established religion which made it the done thing for society and came in ultimately through nominal membership. One protest was the Pentecostal one of Montanism, the other was the monastic one, monasticism. Both were saying the church is not what Jesus Christ meant it to be. One said we will rediscover it by getting back into the spirit, and the other said we will rediscover it by getting out of the world and out of the church. Both of them made their protest, but alas, came to naught because they did not get back to the New Testament Christianity in total. Now we come to the Dark Ages from about the year 400 to 1000 AD, roughly starting with that event which we call the Fall of Rome. Now that's where I really want to begin the story tonight. In the year 410 AD, a catastrophe came. The barbarians from the north pressed down on the city of Rome. They came, the vandals, as we still call people who destroy everything in their track, the vandals came, the Franks came, the Huns came, the Goths came. These barbarians, called barbarians because of their war cry, Baba, Baba, the barbarians came pressing down into the city of Rome and took it. And the Rome of that day fell. The Romans left Britain in that year to go back and defend the city, but they were not able to do it. And as soon as the Romans got out of Britain, the Jutes and the Angles and the Saxons came charging in here and they destroyed Christianity in England and in South East Scotland. So that Christianity, which had been brought here by Roman soldiers and which was in England within the first 400 years, vanished. When the Romans left Britain, those Anglo-Saxons came in and just conquered it all. Now, it seemed as if when Rome fell, as if this was the end of everything, Jerome, writing in Jerusalem, said this, the human race is included in the ruins. And people thought, that's the end of everything. Rome is gone, there's nothing left. And they thought it was the end of civilization. It was puzzling to the church because Rome was now Christian and yet here it was. It had survived hundreds of years as a pagan empire, now as a Christian when it collapsed. And many Christians couldn't understand this. But there was one man who thought it through and who came up with the most incredible statement. He said it's the best thing that ever happened. And his name was St. Augustine. Now, you can buy his books on the railway bookstall today, and if I tell you some of the things this great man said, you'd recognize them. He said, our hearts are restless, and they can find no rest until they find their rest in thee. I suppose the most quoted prayer of history. <laughs>
It was Augustine who prayed, give me chastity, but not just yet. A prayer which ought to have been repeated in history. It was Augustine who said, love and do what you like. That's another of his famous sayings. But let me tell you a little about him. He's had more influence on church history than any other man after the Apostle Paul. He was born in North Africa, and when he went as a student to the University of Carthage, he got into the wrong crowd of young men, and he pretty soon had a concubine by whom he had a son. He lived in an illegal relationship with her for some 20 years. He had a pagan father, but a very godly and saintly mother who prayed for him with tears every day and prayed for this wayward son of hers, Augustine. Later, because of his brilliant mind and academic career, he was invited to be a professor of rhetoric in Milan University. And when he went there, he went to hear the saintly Bishop Ambrose, whose hymn you sang at the beginning of this service and whose mortal remains I've looked upon. And under the preaching of that bishop, this young man, Augustine, with his brilliant mind, but with his thoroughly profligate living, was brought into a tremendous conviction of uncertainty and sin. And one day, sitting in a garden, weeping over the mess he'd made of his life, he heard, heard a child's voice, a boy's vo voice over the garden wall, saying, Tolly leggy, tolly leggy, take up and read. He never knew who that boy was, but he noticed a scroll on the seat by him and he took it up and read it and it was Romans it was Paul's letter to the Romans and Augustine read it through and the light dawned when he walked out in the street afterwards the woman he'd lived with saw him and he ran away from her and she ran after him and said Augustine it is I it is I and he replied shouting over his shoulder but it is not I it is not I Gradually he got his life straightened out and he began to write and he's written down the whole story of his conversion in a book called Confessions, the Confessions of St. Augustine and I saw it on the local railway bookstore just a week or two back. And you can buy it and read it, this great man. Now when he was in his mid-middle age, Rome fell and the whole world seemed to collapse about his ears. And Augustine went to thinking about this, and finally he wrote a second book. He wrote many, but the second great book which we remember is called City of God. And in it he says this, it's a good thing that this pagan city of Rome has collapsed because now the city of God can replace it. It's a good thing that an earthly empire has come to end because the heavenly empire can now be established. And this was his book, and it brought hope and new life to many people. It brought them to see that there was a city of God that still survived when the city of men had gone. Now I'm afraid that was the trouble because people began to say, now what is this city of God? Is it a visible thing or an invisible thing? Is it an earthly or a heavenly? And I'm afraid at this point Augustine led many people into a misunderstanding through this second book. And the funny thing is that Centuries later, in the Reformation, the Protestants said, we follow Augustine, and the Roman Catholics said, we follow Augustine. But the Protestants were following his first book, Confessions, and the Roman Catholics were following his second book, City of God. For this is what happened. The church said, well, if that's the truth, then the church is now the new empire. And one of the first results of this was the rise of the Roman bishop to the position of emperor. Now, in those days, there was a great debate about the word pope. It means essentially father. And in spite of the fact that Jesus had said, don't ever call anyone on earth father, you have one father in heaven. In spite of that, they began to call the local priest father, then they called the regional bishops father, and then finally, the five great bishops of Jerusalem, Alexandria, Constantinople, Rome, and one other which I've forgotten, Carthage was it, they began to say, now look, if you're going to call anybody father, it ought to be us five. And finally, the bishop of Rome said, now look, the city of Rome's gone, but I'm the emperor now. I'm the chief bishop, and from now on, you only call me pope. You only call me father. And the papacy, as we know it, came into being.
And the interesting thing is that the Pope adopted the titles and even the robes of the Roman Emperor. He adopted the title Pontifex Maximus, otherwise known today as the Pontiff. And it's the Roman Emperor's title. And you see, Augustine's idea was mistaken, and people thought the church is the new empire, and it must have its emperor, and it must have its robes, it must have its ceremonies, it must have its throne. And so the church became an empire, and the pope became a king. Now, of course, you would imagine that many Christians were having none of that. The French Christians wouldn't have it. The Irish Christians wouldn't have it, the Welsh Christians wouldn't have it, and the Scottish Christians wouldn't have it. I'm afraid the English Christians did. And at one time it looked as if the British Isles would be caught between those who believed Christianity didn't have a Pope and those who believed it did. You see, Ireland, through St. Columba, went into Iona and into Scotland and led Scotland to Christ. And then down came Aden to the island of Lindisfarne off Northumberland. And about two months ago, I was standing on the island of Lindisfarne at the ruins of Aden's church there on the little island from which he evangelized Northumberland. And so this non-papal Christianity, Celtic Christianity, came through Ireland and Scotland into England in the north. But later the Pope said, we've got to get England, we've got to get those angles. He said, they must be angels, those angles, and so he sent a missionary called another Augustine, and Augustine landed on the island of Thanet, Columba on the island of Iona in Scotland, Augustine on the island of Thanet, and then later at Canterbury. And these two sorts of Christianity met at Whitby, and you can see the ruins uh, above Whitby Harbour where they met. And there in the year 660 AD, papal Christianity met Celtic Christianity. Which would win? The tragedy is papal Christianity won. And the British Isles came under the papal throne. Scotland even changed its patron saint from St. John to St. Andrew. And the whole situation was changed. Now, the other great group of Christians that would have none of this were the churches of the eastern part of the Mediterranean, the churches of Greece, of Asia Minor, of Syria, of Egypt. And they said, we are not acknowledging this, this is not scriptural, that there should be one Papa, one Father of the whole church. This is not New Testament. And there began a split which was finally completed by the year 1054 that kept the East and the West churches apart until the last 10 years. I mean the 10 years now, in 1960s. Only in the last 10 years of the Eastern and the Western churches even begun to talk together. For a thousand years they split over this very thing. And of course they've still got to resolve it even when they begin to talk. But the church became an empire, and the man who did it most was, of course, Pope Gregory. There was Leo the Great. He claimed to be Peter's successor. And one of the most incredible things happened. In the year 850, the Pope said, I have discovered certain documents which go back to the very first century, which prove that Peter appointed the first Pope, and he appointed the second, and he appointed the third, and so it went on. We now know, and the Roman Church now knows, that those documents were a forgery. They are now known as the forged decretals. And yet the papacy was built on a forgery. Furthermore, there was another forgery called the Donation of Constantine, which claimed that all of Italy belonged to the Pope. And the Pope discovered this forged document and said, there, all Italy belongs to me. This is the kind of foundation on which that whole structure was based. And even Rome knows that it is today, and yet still persists in claiming it. And so the power was extended until the year 742. And in that year a man was born who got a dream, and his dream was that the empire of Rome should be restored and put back on the map with himself as emperor and the Pope beneath him, and his name, Charlemagne, Charlemagne. That name strikes a chill when you hear it, Charlemagne, the ruthless man who said, we'll have a Roman Empire back again, and its head will not be the Pope, but an emperor. And Charlemagne saved the Pope's life twice. 
once from the barbarians and once from the crowds in Rome who were angry with him. And the Pope said, you've saved my life twice. What will you have me do for you? And the emperor said, Christmas Day, crown me emperor. And in the year 800 AD, on Christmas Day, in the largest church in Rome, on the Christmas morning service, the Pope crowned the king of the Franks, Charlemagne, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And a thousand years later, the Holy Roman Empire still existed. Now you see, you've come full circle. The empire of Rome collapsed in 410. The church took over the empire, and then in 800, the emperor came back and took over the empire from the church. And it looked as if the whole thing was back again to where it started. Now Charlemagne did some good things, and he did some bad things. He stopped the clergyman having concubines and visiting taverns and going hunting among some of his good works. Among some of his bad works were that he forbade clergy ever to marry. And it's to Charlemagne that we owe the celebrate priesthood. And this man came back and started a lot of schools and did a lot of good. But the one idea that he had was an idea of a kingdom in which he and the Pope were partners with himself as the senior partner in the business. And he coined the phrase Christendom, Christendom, meaning the kingdom which would be Christian under the emperor. And the word Christendom is an idea that has persisted even to this day. And there are still some who hope that one day there'll be a Christendom, a kingdom which will be a Christ's kingdom or a Christendom. Now the church, because it was powerful and wealthy, was corrupt. And once again, I want to tell you about the protests that came. We now had a church that had a pope as its head, a church that worshipped images, a church that taught people that they would be saved by doing pilgrimage and penance, a church that was telling people all sorts of things that you cannot find in the New Testament. The protest came in the east and in the north. It came in the east from two things. First, from Mohammedanism. The greatest judgment there has ever been on the Christian church was the rise of Islam. Now, I've lived in Arabia and I've seen something of this religion. Let me tell you a bit about it. Muhammad was born in 571. He was born in a town called Mecca. Mecca. And Mecca was the center of idolatrous superstition for the Arab race. In the middle of Mecca was a huge square building, not quite as big as this church, covered with curtains, a black curtain, and in it was a, a sacred stone, the Kaaba, a meteorite that had fallen from the sky. But there was much other superstition and idolatry in Arabia. And this man, Muhammad, grew up with the idolatry and superstition of the Arabs. And he was revolted and disgusted by it. So, now listen to this. So he turned first to the Jews and then to the Christians and said, have you got the true religion? The tragedy that Muhammad never met a converted Christian. The tragedy that he never saw real Christianity of the New Testament kind. The tragedy of it. All he saw were priests' investments and images and crucifixes. And he said that's as idolatrous as the Arabs' religion. Now if only Muhammad had met one true Christian at the end of the 6th century, but he didn't. And so he said, right, I'm going to seek a new religion that is pure. And he turned away from this wretched, perverted Christianity, which by this time was all that he could find. And so he married a wealthy widow, and he spent years in the desert. And in the desert, he says, he was spoken to, and a voice said, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. He began to preach this. He wrote down what he heard in his visions in a book, the Holy Quran, al Quran. And he was persecuted and he had to flee to Medina in the year 622. And that is the date from which the Arabs take all their calendar. And so their year is not our year. He came back to Mecca with an army and he imposed the new religion on Mecca with an army. From then on everybody had to pray to Mecca.
And by a religion of good works, by fasting, by praying five times in a day, fasting during Ramadan, by making pilgrimage to Mecca, by giving alms to the poor, you could get to heaven. And that religion was imposed with a force of arms. And Mohammedanism swept Christianity out of the Mediterranean. It swept Christianity out of the North African coast, and there wasn't a church there for centuries. It swept Christianity out of the Holy Land itself, out of Jerusalem, out of the place where Jesus died. It swept up through Spain and up through Asia Minor. It swept into France and got as far as the gates of Lyon. It swept into Eastern Europe and got as far as Vienna. And it looked as if Mohammedanism was going to crush Christianity in a gigantic pincer movement. It's the greatest judgment God has ever allowed to come on the Christian church. And it was deserved. And Christianity vanished over most of the Mediterranean coast. But so far and no further, God was not going to have Christianity wiped out altogether. And he stopped them at Lyon and Vienna, and they withdrew to their present boundaries, namely the North African coast and up to Turkey. Because at this time, all over Europe, there were little groups of Christians meeting around the word of God. They saw that the official church was corrupt and they simply met together in tiny groups and they read this book and they said, we'll worship God in simplicity. We'll worship together. We don't need priests. We've got Jesus, our high priest. We don't need a pope. We've got a father in heaven. We don't need all this paraphernalia. We just need the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And so they met. Now, we hardly know anything about them because they were so persecuted that even the records of their history are destroyed. I wonder if I asked you to put up your hand. I don't think I will, but if I asked you, I wonder how many have ever heard of a group of people called the Bugger Mills. They were a group of people who met around the word of God all over Europe. They met primarily in uh, Bulgaria and Bosnia. And the word Bogomil means, it's the Bulgarian word for friends, friends of God. There were the Paulicians who met in Armenia and Thrace and Asia Minor. There were the Cathari, a name which means the pure ones, the pure ones, same as the later word Puritan. They met in the Balkans. And all over Europe, all through these ages, I used to think in my simplicity that for a thousand years the only church was the Roman church and the Eastern churches. This is not true. And I was thrilled to discover that all through those centuries there is a continuous train of groups of simple Christians who met around the word of God in local churches. They paid for it with their lives, but they met. And the flame of faith was kept alight for succeeding generations. Well, now let's pause now and sing a hymn. And then the second half of our story, which will be more brief. So we come to the final chapter tonight from the year 1000 to the year 1500. We call these the Middle Ages because they cover the period between the Dark Ages and the Modern Age. They're in between. Now, the man I must speak to you about first was a man called Hildebrand. This monk became Pope, and he didn't like being number two. We now had a restored Roman Empire with a new emperor, but the Pope was number two. And Hildebrand decided that the Pope should be number one. I'm putting that very simply, but that's precisely what happened. And Hildebrand achieved it. He did many good things. He cut out some of the simony in the church. That means buying priesthoods. He cut out many things that were wrong, but he did it because he believed the Pope should be in control of everything, including kings. And a battle between Hildebrand and the Emperor Henry IV by this time was settled in a most dramatic and terrible way. Henry IV defied Hildebrand and said, I am number one. Hildebrand said, you are not. Let the people decide. And the people decided that Hildebrand was. And away up in the Alps, the Pope met the Roman Emperor Henry IV, who came from the north of Europe, and they met up in the Alps above the snow. And the Pope was in a mountain house, and he kept Emperor Henry IV waiting outside in the snow, barefooted for three days. 
before he would speak to him. And in this way, Hildebrand put the emperor not only in number two, but very definitely in a secondary place. From now for the next 500 years, the Pope is the most influential figure. And the papacy is the power that controls the Western world. The church is now the empire again. And it was this Pope that started the symbol for the Popes, which my son Richard wears on his school uniform. Much to my disgust. The crossed keys of Chalfon St. Peter. One of those keys is the key of sacred authority over the church, and the other is the key of secular authority over the state. And the crossed keys of St. Peter, which are part of our local community, Chris, are in fact the claim of Hildebrand to be top dog, to be over the church and over the state. Now this put the physical force of armies at the church's disposal. And because Hildebrand thought this way, he began to use force to establish the kingdom of Christ. Never was a greater mistake made. And the first outcome of this idea that force is valid for the church to use was eight crusades to the Holy Land. And we have now entered into the period of the Crusades. By this time, the holy places, Jerusalem and others, were in the hands of Muslims, in hands of the Saracens, the Turks. And the Pope, encouraged by others, decided that the church would fight its way in and capture the Holy Land for Christ. And the first crusade was born in 1095. It was Hildebrand's idea, but he died before it could be done. But even during his lifetime, people were setting off. Now, just as people today have a craze for marching, you know, walk so many miles, you sponsor me, and so on, the craze today is marching. Now, that's precisely the craze that there was then. And it was considered the cause to walk for, the cause to march for. And there were walks in aid of this all over the place to raise money, to do all sorts of things. So there's nothing new under the sun. And you walked because you were crusading. And you wore... Uh, a thing on your shoulders, you wore a cross on your shoulders, and this was called a crux aid, and from that we get the word crusade, and you marched behind these banners or with these things on your shoulders, not epaulets. The first crusade was pulled together by an unkempt, uncouth, fanatical preacher called Peter the Hermit, and he set off with 600,000 men and only a tenth of them arrived. Most of them died in the high mountains of Turkey. But they got there, and they took Jerusalem, and they pillaged it, and they raped the women, and they established the so-called rule of Christ in Jerusalem by slaughtering all the Saracens of that city. Now, is that Christian? You say straight away, of course it isn't, but bear in mind they were misled. And thousands of people thought this was what the church was meant to be, an earthly empire establishing itself by force. Mind you, there were incentives. They were offered absolution from their sins if they'd go and fight for Christ. They were offered indulgences, so many years off purgatory, which was now believed in. They were told that their debts would be cancelled by law if they went. They were told that they, there was pardon for criminals who would leave prison to go and fight. You can imagine the kind of motley crew that resulted. Philip of France was caught up in it. Richard, King Richard Coeur de Leon of England was caught up in it. And eight times they set off to go and take that place. And a few weeks ago, some of us were looking at the ruins of Crusader castles all over the Holy Land, Acre, Mount Hermon, there they were. It's the greatest disaster there's ever been. One of those crusades was a children's crusade. And 2,000 little mites set off to march across Europe to try and get Palestine back for Jesus. Not one of them ever arrived. The Pope said you will have food miraculously provided for you by angels if you go, but the food never came and the angels never appeared. It's a most incredible story which you ought to read if you want to understand the background of the Reformation. What was the basic failure? The answer is they thought you established the kingdom of Christ by physical force. 
And so there were orders of Christian knights, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, the Knights Templar, and other orders of Christian knights. It all sounded grand. It was worth marching for. It caught the imagination of young people, and off they went by the thousand to their death. The last one was an utter failure. And we looked a few weeks ago at the flat-topped mountain of the Horns of Hittin, where the last Crusader Empire died of uh, Crusader army died of thirst, besieged by the Saracens. And in 1270, Europe breathed a sigh of relief because the Pope called the whole thing off. It's one of the saddest stories in the history of the Church. It did nothing, nothing. And indeed, it did worse than nothing. From using force outside the church, the Pope now decided to use force inside the church and began another dreadful chapter called the Inquisition. I dare not go into a description of the things done in the name of Christ. The bishops refused to run this dreadful machine of cruelty and malice and suspicion to force people to toe the Christian line. But the Dominicans took it up and for many years Many, many people went in fear of their lives through that dreadful thing, the Inquisition. All the way through, what was wrong was this. The church thought of itself as an earthly empire that was valid in using force to establish the cause of Christ. We now know this is not the way to do it. We know that the church must use no other force but love and must never force anyone except through love and through preaching the gospel to accept Christ. And, of course, this kind of corruption soon turns in on itself. Power tends to corrupt, said Lord Acton, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. And, by the way, that's the right quotation of his words. I've had about six versions, but that's the right one. I've checked up. And it corrupted. And very soon the Pope was two Popes, and there were two fighting for the throne, and then three Popes, and people wondered what on earth the world was coming to. There was a pope in Avignon, sur le pont d'Avignon, there was the pope. It was the pontiff of, at Avignon, not just the pont, and there he was. And there was a pope somewhere else, and there was a pope in Rome, and the three of them, who's pope now? You see, this kind of behavior soon leads to that kind of disintegration. They managed to pull the papacy together, but then the corruption began to come further down. The monasteries became corrupt, they became too wealthy, the bishops became too powerful, the parishes became corrupt, and the practices of ordinary Christian religion were corrupt. There were prayers to Mary. We were never told to pray to Mary. She's a human being like the rest of us. There were prayers for the dead. There were prayers to the saints. There was the doctrine which caused the greatest fear, the doctrine of purgatory, how many years you go through suffering after you die. There was the doctrine of the mass, the sacrifice, so-called, of the Lord's Supper, offered by the priest. There was confession to the priest. There were indulgences so that for a sum of money you could buy so many years off purgatory. There were pilgrimage. There were worships of relics. There were images in worship. Now, none of this was in the New Testament, not a scrap. But when such corruption sets in, everything seems to go wrong. And when such power and wealth come to the church, it's not long before worship and other things are destroyed. Now, what was the basic fault behind all this? And if you forget most of what I've said tonight, this is important. What was wrong? I'll tell you what was wrong in one sentence. The church had begun to think she was Christ and still does. I asked a leading priest a few months ago, is this still true? And he says, yes, that will not change. I was asking about the Vatican Council and discussing it with him. And I said, look, my one difference, my one problem is this, that I do not believe the church is Christ. And I do not believe that she is prophet, priest, and king. I believe that Jesus is. And the church is not our prophet or our priest or our king. And he told me very frankly, we will not discuss that nor will the Vatican Council, because that will never change. Now, that's the basic fault. If I believe I'm the prophet to the world, then I can tell the world what to believe, and I can say infallibly what is true. 
And if I am the world's priest, I can say, you've got to come to my sacraments, you've got to confess to me if you're ever going to find salvation. And if I think that I'm the king of the world, then I will establish my authority as widely as I can. It's a confusion between the head and the body of the church. The head is divine, the body is human. And it's Christ who is the head, and it is he who is prophet, priest, and king, and the church is not. Now that is the basic difference between Protestantism and Catholicism, and it is as big a difference today as it ever was, and there is no change in the situation. Not an inch has moved in this regard. And it was during the Middle Ages that the papacy began to think of itself as prophet, priest, and king, and as the vicar of Christ on earth so that when the Pope speaks from his seat, it is Christ who is speaking. Now that is the fundamental thing. And brethren, I say it in love, but that is still the issue. And it hasn't changed one inch. And it's still the biggest question to be faced. If you want a book that will make this crystal clear to you, it is a book by a man, an Italian, Vittoria de Subilia, called The Problem of Catholicism, and it's a book I've loaned to priests, and they've told me quite frankly when they've read it, that's a good book, that's the best Protestant book there is on Rome, and that's what the reviews in the Roman Catholic press have said, it's the best Protestant book on Rome there has been, and it's absolutely accurate in what we believe, and we are not changing what we do believe, and this is it. Now, next Sunday night, you'll see the film of a man who saw this, and who realized that this is what had gone wrong. The church is not Christ, therefore the church is not king. The city of God is something whose builder and maker is God, not man. And Christ said, I will build my church. He didn't say, you build it. And Christ is the head of the church, and no one else is the head, and no one else must be. Even in a local church, the minister can try and be head of the church. The elders can try and be head of the church. But my prayer is that the government of this church shall be upon his shoulder and that Christ shall be the head of the church. There is no other, and there can never be. And when the church begins to behave as if it's Christ, then all this happens, and these things come in. Now I'm happy to say that there were protests. I'm happy to say that all through the Middle Ages, from 1,000 to 1,500, there were people who said, this is not true. This is not Christianity. This is not what Jesus meant to happen. These little groups again, they were named by all sorts of names, names of the places they were. And I just want to mention four to give you some idea. There were the Beghards. Did you ever hear of them? B-E-G-H-R-D-S of the Netherlands, the Beghards. There they were, and they were just people who met around the book and said, Christ is the head of our church. And then there were the Waldenses, named after the Waldensian Valley in northern Italy where they began. And the Waldenses said this, we believe that this book, the scriptures tell us what Jesus meant the church to be. And bless them, they went to the Pope and they said, this is what we see. Could we be recognized as validly part of the church if we practice this book? Could they have done more? They wanted to stay in the Roman church, but they wanted to follow this book. And the Pope said, no, if you do what you intend to do, we will persecute you. And they did. And the Waldensians fled from one valley to another. The next group were the Albigenses in southern France. And the Albigenses again said this. They read this book and they said, well, now we see what the church is meant to be like and what Christians are meant to be like. And I'm afraid the most bloody campaign that was ever promulgated from the papacy was against these dear people, the Albigenses. But there were two Spanish noblemen sent by the Pope to put to death these Albigenses. And they came, and they came back to the Pope, and they said, but these are good Christians. They're not criminals. They're not fighting you. They want to be in the church. They want to practice their understanding of the Scripture. And those two Spanish noblemen, one of whom was named Dominic, said, we'll try and bring this within the church. And they started the Dominicans. Have you heard of them? And they were a copy of the Albigenses outside the church. And these Spanish noblemen, led by Dominic, said, we'll have this within the church. It's a tragedy that later that order of the Dominicans so corrupted itself that they were willing to do the Inquisition 
and they were, but nevertheless, that's how they arose. There were others, they were the brethren of the common life in Germany. All of these were independent of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. They based everything on the Bible in the people's language, and they were all persecuted to the death. They all had that in common. The true church has always been persecuted. Now, among those inside the church who saw this as well, were people who withdrew from the churches and saw it privately, and one is this man, Bernard of Clairvaux, whose hymn you've just sung. A very serious young man, although in his youth he'd been the ringleader of a real gang of thieves, but after he'd been a prisoner of war for two years, in the wars of Italy, he came to himself and he realized that he was wasting his life. He became a serious man, the son of a French baron. He withdrew from his riches and he withdrew with 12 friends into a valley, a valley full of robbers in the French uh, southern country in France. There he lived on cooked beech leaves and herbs and lived a, a terribly poor life. He got his friends up at two every morning for prayer didn't let them stop work till 8 o'clock at night. And they built a community in the Valley of Clairvaux. And Bernard became one of the most powerful Christians in Europe. He even chose one pope. And he did it without any office, without any money, without any material or psychological force whatsoever. He did it because he was the great Christian that he was. And people came to him from all over and asked him advice. And then he went out and preached all over. And Bernard of Clairvaux became a, a very great man, an influential man, because of his moral character. He was later called the Pope Maker because he put Innocent III on the papal throne. In private, he loved Jesus. And Martin Luther once said, Of all the monks and priests of history, I have the highest esteem for Bernard of Clairvaux whose hymn you've just sang. Alas, in public, he felt bound to support the papacy, and someone has wisely said he set back the Reformation by at least two centuries. And I'm afraid this man, with his wonderful private love of the Lord, publicly set back what might have happened. Now, the other man about this time, and almost at the same time, was a man whose name you know only too well, Francis, born in the little town of Assisi, and this man, Francis, was brought up to face life by meeting a beggar, in, a leper, in the street. And he walked right past that leper on the other side. And as he walked past, he thought, what sort of a man am I to walk away from a fellow man? And he went back and kissed the leper. And Francis then began to be serious about life. And he sought Christ, and he found Christ. And Francis gathered around him a number of friends who went out two by two, in utter poverty, preaching the gospel, winning people for Christ. And though he is better remembered for his way with animals and birds, and he had a remarkable way with them, and his love of nature was unique, Francis ought to be remembered because Francis was the first missionary to the Muslims. And he, risking his life, he went to the Sultan himself to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the head of the Muslims. Francis was the first missionary to the Muslims. Instead of going with 600,000 soldiers to fight them, Francis went alone in poverty to preach the love of Jesus. And he was the first and last missionary to the Arab Muslims for many a century. Not until Raymond Lull was there another attempt to take the gospel to him. Such was Francis. And these men stand out. Francis and his followers wore grey robes, and they became known as the Grey Friars. And you'll find Grey Friars the name in city streets. They came here. And then the Dominicans wore black robes, so they were called the Black Friars. And you'll find Black Friars commemorated in city streets in London. So the Grey Friars and the Black Friars tried to bring back the simple Christian life into the church. But the sad story is that they too failed and became corrupt, and the Franciscans became professional beggars, and the Dominicans ran the Inquisition. You see, the whole situation was crying out for someone to say what the truth was, and say it so well that everybody would hear and understand. A man called Arnold of Brescia in 1150, he began it and he said, wealth and worldly power should not be in the church's hands. But alas, Bernard of Clairvaux opposed him and got him quietened. Then came a man called Marsilius, 
who was a medical doctor and reading his Bible, he said, the Bible is the standard of the church and no other. And bishops and popes are human inventions. But he was silenced. An Englishman who was a professor in the University of Paris, a man called William of Ockham, he said this and he was silenced until finally it fell to the lot of a Yorkshireman to be what is called the morning star of the Reformation. You know the morning star? That star that you can still see when the sun is coming up. And the morning star of the Reformation was a Yorkshireman who came to Oxford as a brilliant student, who became a professor at Oxford, and who traveled around a great deal and was nicknamed Dr. Evangelicus. Dr. Evangelicus. And you can guess why. His name, John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe. And that man rediscovered the Bible, I suppose, more than anyone else till Martin Luther, he got it across. He protested against papal abuse. There were five decrees of the pap papacy against him. They were called bulls in those days. Five bulls were issued. He was taken to Canterbury and put on trial. But he turned to the scriptures, the only law of the church, and he said, I'm going to put this Bible from Latin into English. I'm going to cause the plowboys to know this book. And John Wycliffe painstakingly translated this Bible knowing that if you can put the Bible into ordinary men and women's hands, you've given them the answer to all corruption in the church. And so he worked away at this and he achieved it. And he gathered around him a group of preachers who used to walk around quite simply in the villages with Wycliffe's translation of the Bible and they would preach in the market square and they would sing and they were good singers. And they sang the gospel and wherever you'll find the gospel really preached you'll find it sung too. And they were called those who sang lullabies or lullards. Lullard and lullaby are the same word. And so these lullaby preachers, these lullards, went up and down England preaching this word and singing it to the ordinary people in the marketplace. And something was happening that was going to lead to tremendous things. You go to Amersham, I've spoken about this many times before, but go to Amersham, go up Station Road, turn left through the houses into the field. There's a monument to people who were burned alive by their own children who were forced to light the bonfires. And who burned their parents to death. Why? Because they were caught in Amersham Woods reading the Bibles. And it was the result of Wycliffe and the Lollards that that happened and that that monument is up there. You should know this. It happened in the Chilterns. And Wycliffe went everywhere. And the interesting thing is that he died as the rector of Lutterworth, just off the M1 south of Leicester. And he died peacefully as the rector preaching there. Do you know the other day I went into that church in Lutterworth? It would have broken John Wycliffe's heart. It was more Roman than Rome. I could hardly see for the incense. And the high liturgy, there it was. John Wycliffe was rector at Lutterworth, within reach of a, an afternoon's ride from here, and there he preached the word, and he condemned the corruption that there was in the church. Now, he... He was at Oxford, and there was another university in Europe that had a close link with Oxford. It was the University of Prague. And the rector of Prague was a poor peasant boy who had risen by sheer hard work to be the rector of the University of Prague. And his name was John as well, and it was John Huss. And John Huss heard of Wycliffe, and he began to read Wycliffe's books, and Huss began to preach the same thing in Prague. And John Huss was finally arrested, and the Pope condemned him to be burned to death. And the Hussites were put to death. And when word got back to England that the Pope had burned John Huss, do you know what they did? They went to Lutterworth. Church authorities went to Lutterworth and they dug up the body of John Wycliffe and they burned it on a bonfire and the ashes they threw into the River Swift at Lutterworth. But you know what someone said about that? As the River Swift will bear the ashes into the River Avon. And as the river Avon will bear the ashes into the river Severn. And as the river Severn will bear the ashes into the channels around our shores. And as those channels will bear those ashes to the oceans. So will the teachings of John Wycliffe spread throughout the world. And that was an amazing prophecy. And so I come to my last few moments. We're on the brink of something exciting. Don't you get excited? You can see that this could not go on forever. Such an abuse of the Church of Christ could not be tolerated by men and women.
And they were beginning to see, and the one thing that was enabling them to see was that they were beginning to read this book in their own language. And wherever this book goes, it'll do this. It'll put things right. Now I come to my last point, and it's this. The other thing that caused the Reformation was not just the abuse of the church. It was this. It was that men were entering an age of discovery. And they were beginning to get new ideas. They were beginning to discover new things. This was true in the material realm. Christopher Columbus was discovering America, 1492. Copernicus was discovering how the sun, how the earth went round the sun and not the other way round. Galileo was putting the telescope to his blinding eyes and he was looking at the stars. It was an age of new discovery in the material realm. It was beginning to be the age of science when men would question things. Furthermore, it was a new age of discovery in mental realms. They were rediscovering Greek literature and Greek art. And in Raphael's paintings, you will see the rediscovery of ancient culture coming up because Constantinople had fallen to the text and the Greek treasures of art had been swept away into Rome and into Italy. And the new art and the new learning were being spread because the printing press had now been invented and there was a whole area of new learning and one of the great new scholars was a man called Erasmus. And among many other things, Erasmus began to rediscover the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament. It was a, a rediscovery of old things as well as a discovery of new. And so Erasmus said, I'm going to get such an accurate New Testament that even women, Scots, Irish, Turks, and Saracens will be able to get the message. All due apologies, but that's what Erasmus said. And so he produced an accurate New Testament. And instead of the word penance, appeared the word repentance. And many things were put right that were wrong in the Bible that they had. Now, all this was an area of tremendous new discovery. But this is the final thing I want to say tonight. In all this tremendous discovery of mental things, of art and music, of sculpture, of all the tremendous movement mentally, which we call the Renaissance, they discovered one thing, that if people are intellectually better, they are not morally better. And it was the age when the popes were filling their palace with art treasures, and it was the age of Caesar and Lucretia Borgia, the most immoral papal family there's been. It was an age when men were studying art and music and literature, an age when they were studying the heavens and an age in which they were immoral. And the Renaissance was a purely mental thing and cultural thing. It was not meeting the need of sin. The whole world was waiting for a man to rediscover salvation. For a man to grapple with the moral problem of the human race, of the church and the world. For a man who would go to this book and from his own experience of sin and salvation rediscover the secret of the Christian power to change the world and to change men in it. And that man was Martin Luther, a monk. And that man's story you're going to see next Sunday night. That man made the most important discovery of the 16th century. And 450 years ago, this very month, he made that discovery public and swept thousands of people into the truth of Jesus Christ. It's the most dramatic thing. The Renaissance was mental, but the Reformation was moral. It tackled the real problem, which is not our lack of knowledge, it is not our lack of science. It is not our lack of music or art or culture, helpful though these things are. The real thing men needed to discover was that we lack Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation. Let us pray. Father, we've thought of so many things tonight and so many years and centuries have rolled by. And some of these events have gripped our imagination and some of them have made us very sad when we think of all that's been done in the name of the Church of Christ. Lord, we pray that we may be the sort of church you want us to be. We pray that we may learn from the mistakes of the past. We pray that we may learn the lessons of history, the history of your people and the history of our brethren and sisters in Jesus Christ. 
And we thank you that through all those ages you were never without witness, never without those who knew the truth, who paid for it often with their lives, but kept alight that flaming torch of faith which we inherit to pass on to succeeding generations. O oh Lord, we pray for your church today. Where it is corrupt, cleanse it. Where it is in error, lead her to the truth. Where she is divided, unite her. Where she is lazy, quicken her. Where the churches are empty, fill them. Where the gospel is preached, may it be done with conviction and power. And above all, may Jesus Christ be seen to be the head of the church and the only head of the church. And may we be seen to be his body, perfectly obeying the head in all things. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen.